had uh, a connection for quite a long time. So over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the short version of that is I write for anyone with money. <laughs> <laughs> so if you've got money and you need something written, you so know where to find it. Um, yeah, it's a privilege to be here today um, and to offer some thoughts on Mandy's work. We've known each other for about 10 years and we've shared space in and around the city. So it's not often, you know, when you're partners in crime on an arts level, it's not often you get asked to give thoughts on someone you work with and they work. So it's a privilege in that sense um, to, to, to offer what I think. And I've always thought about Mandy and her work and the work we see around us. So the work we see around us is clearly beautiful. You know, it's beautiful to look at. It's beautifully composed. The composition is sophisticated in terms of tools and materials. And Mandy's offering us thoughts on what it means to be in very cliched and virtual commas and very environmentally aware. So the circles of the trees, that piece in the corner, suggest to us that trees have stories to tell too, um, if we would stop chopping them down. Um, the, the cow suggests to us that we should think about the animals we eat, how we eat them, when we eat them, why we eat them, and what it means, and, and so forth. You know. Um, you know, when one's asked to give a talk, it's particularly satisfying to be able to give a talk when there's something to talk about. And in the arts world, that's by no means always the case. <laughs> so, I just, you know, many years ago when I was a student, I had a friend named David Clark, who was a spectacular guitarist. Um, and he had a particular penchant uh, for creative wisdom, for little nuggets of insight that would allow him to go from student to creative professional. And so David was at... Um, Kippies in Newtown watching Huma Sakela play, and he fought his way backstage through the fans and the groupies, and he tapped Huma Sakela on the back and he said, Please, Brow Hughes, what have you learned through all your years working as a creative professional? What can you teach me? I'm a young guitarist and I'm going to go professional. And Huma Sakela stopped for a second, thought about it, and said, Money cock mark me, and walked away. <laughs> 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 That story stuck with me throughout my life, throughout my professional life, and it's something that's kind of occurred to me um, as I've been thinking about Mandy's show and what to say today. You know, <laughs> so I think, you know, fine artists, fine artists have a, a really weird life because they operate at this very strange intersection between creativity and commerce. So you you educated as a fine artist in terms of your technique and your ability to take a concept and communicate it to other people and off you got. And then when you go to become a professional artist, suddenly you find that you're being viewed and assessed by your peers and teachers in the industry, not only in terms of your technique and your concept, but in terms of your marketing fizz, in terms of the hype, in terms of the PR, in terms of creating a narrative when you tweet and all that kind of stuff. And there's this kind of frisson in the, in the art industry that you now have to deal with, and it's the frisson of public relations. So art is strange because it's a traded commodity. We buy and sell it like it was oil, but there's no actual way of valuing art other than stories. So the stories that they tell about you at university and in galleries and in the media and in the art industry, well, that defines your price tag. And your price tag is your work. And that's a really strange thing for a young artist or old artist as you go from studying to selling art. You have to deal with these conflicting narratives about who you are and what you do. And so what I've seen amongst young and old artists is people fall foul of these mythological ideas. On the one hand, you've got Van Gogh dying alone with his ear in his hand, uh, unrecognized, you know. And then on the other hand, you've got Damien Hirst, who was created kind of out of thin air by Saatchi and Saatchi who bought his art and then spent two decades putting their skills to work to pump up the value uh, and now Damien Hurst is a significant investment. And so you see artists going either in one direction where they're creating conceptual art in the hope of creating their spills, but quite clearly the art doesn't uh, offer anything to the viewer unless you have a 300 page thesis in your hand. And then on the other hand, you've got artists who stay in their room and just make art that no one will ever see because they're too scared to participate um, in the art world. And so there's a very difficult dichotomy for artists to manage as they go into the world and create their art. But it's a dichotomy that we all really face in global society because the one story doesn't make the other story not true. We, 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 we wrestle with competing stories all the time. So in this environmental realm, we've got this global story about the goose, and we've got our hand around its neck, and we're killing it, and we all understand that. And now we're trying to compose solutions to what we've done. And one of the things we do 
on a narrative level and practically is piecing together these quite fragile and complex mechanisms where we're going to offset one behavior with another. And we're looking to create this sense of equilibrium in how we live and what we do. So when you swipe your Woolworths card, a tree will pop up in Guatemala somewhere. <laughs> and so someone in Uganda can plant a tree and sell it onto the, the global carbon market and get those dollars. Instead of chopping down trees, people plant trees and, and can get dollars. And then someone in Bank who's polluting can buy those carbon credits on the exchange to offset their pollution and to not be taxed to hell by the new legislation. And so in, in this kind of structure that we're putting together, there's this idea of equilibrium all the time. We're trying to compose this equilibrium in how we relate economically to the environment and socially to the environment. And yet at the same time, we know that there are buildings all over the world filled with computers and trailers, um, mega computers, you know, with the kind of computing power that we can barely even comprehend. And we know that our traders are telling our physicists and our mathematicians to design these algorithms. And these algorithms are designed to look at the global market um, and to find points of imbalance and to ruthlessly exploit those points of imbalance by conducting automated mass trades and so on and so on. And actually, our traders and our bankers and our financiers are uh, always at risk of wrecking our ideas of environment and creating this delicate balance and so on and so on. And it's not a mythical idea. This, this is what happened in 2008 when our economy crashed. It wasn't only the brokers who crashed our global economy, it was the brokers and their algorithms and their computers. And it all got out of hand and the bubble burst all over us and now we have to look at the results. So I think that's what you Masekela was saying to my guitarist friend. He was saying, <laughs> be careful about the stories that you're telling yourself about what you need to do to become a rock star or a musician or whatever or whatever. Because those stories can be illusory for professional artists. Because what you're going to have to do, probably as an artist, is spend a huge amount of time by yourself understanding the tools and materials of your art. Developing a relationship, a personal relationship with your art. And then you're going to have to understand your life philosophy and how that life philosophy impacts your art and changes your art. You're going to need to understand that feedback loop and then, my son, you may be in a position to become a rock star. <laughs> so when I look at Maggie's work and her life over the period of time that I've known her, what I see is someone who has spent an extraordinary amount of time coming to terms with what is in her hands, what she is using to create art. So Maggie understands paper on a level that none of us will even comprehend. You know, she understands the constituent parts of various parts of paper. She's traveled across the world and South Africa to understand how to make paper and to make paper take form in various ways. And I think that's part of the resonance of the show that we see around us. It's beautiful, it's conceptually strong, and I believe it's, it's both of those things because the artist has spent a great deal of time exploring her relationship with her art and also exploring her relationship with these broad philosophical ideas, these stories about what it is to be environmentally aware and not, these stories that often just wash us into the conceptual fuzzy land. You know. And so I see the beauty in this work and the power in this work um, being Mandy's lifelong meditation on what she does and what she thinks. And I think she deserves to be congratulated for that, first and foremost. <laughs> The last thing I want to say um, is that you know art operates on two levels as well. There's us here today and the hustle to become famous and get the price up or down or what everyone thinks and all this kind of stuff. But I think the truth is we'll all be dead in a very short period of time and none of what we say or do here today will matter to anyone. You know, we will come, we will go. But art also operates at, the, at, the, at another level. Uh, you know, people have been painting and drawing and making music and books over thousands and thousands of years. And art is the one way that mankind can communicate through space and time and across death and the grave. There's a conversation that goes on across the world um, between humans who are all dead. And I think that is a very valuable conversation for all of us. That's really why we're here today. That's really why we read and listen to music. But it's a very, very rare thing for an artist to be able to compose or create a piece of work that contributes to that conversation. 
It has to be a very good piece of work, otherwise it just fades away. And I think when the aliens dig up our rubble in 2000 years, <laughs> and they're trying to understand us and the goose and our hand, and we know we're killing it, and then we let go, and that's not going to help either, so we grab it again, and that's where we, where we are at the moment. I think Bandy's work in this space and time is a really solid articulation of the challenges we face as individuals and as society, and I think it's something that he must kill with approval. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'd like to say congratulations. I think she's done stunning work. And it's not just now. It's really, really, really. And um, so I think what she's done is amazing. She's already got a concept for her next one, so she's on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> so in about two years' time, you can visit us again. But visit us in between as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the day. If you want to say something, you might. Oh, okay. <laughs>